the rack looks great, doesn't it? It, it really looks beautiful. So I don't want to overemphasize this because I mean, obviously we're in a DC. This is not something that, you know, th that everyone is in. On the one hand, the aesthetics don't really matter. On the other hand, we were making something that we wanted to be proud of. And the beauty of the thing was really important. But when we made something beautiful, it was also really important that we didn't sacrifice manufacturability at all. Right? One of the mistakes that sometimes companies make is they make something beautiful, but then they undermine the economics of the thing that they're, they're, they're making. And Steve Jobs famously did this at Next. Next was a computer company where Jobs insisted on this one, one shade of black and they were doing their own manufacturing and they ended up spending a whole bunch of time and energy trying to, too much time and energy trying to make the thing beautiful. So our challenge was how do we make this thing beautiful without undermining the economics? So I really love what the team did here. We've got the beauty at Oxide where we've got the whole stack of folks. We've got mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, software engineers. We got all the way up to designers and our designer and our mechanical engineer got together and it's like, how can we make something that is beautiful and pragmatic and I love what they came up with with the panels. So this is green plastic that kind of comes through. Very inexpensive to do it this way. And I love what they've done with, with this panel where the panels look kind of artistic and very different, but actually there are only two different panels and we flip, we invert them. So you'll see this same pattern inverted and it looks really interesting, but it's actually pretty pragmatic. Um, so we, we've built something that we think is beautiful, and you, but is also very pragmatic and utilitarian. We're trying to hit the sweet spot there. It's a lot of fun to have mechanical engineers and designers in the same room. You know, you walk in here and uh, you, you look at, you got two pieces of equipment here. Uh, this one's a lot louder than that one. What is in here, one might wonder, that's making such a racket? It's just this. There are two one new servers we have in here. Basically, all of the acoustic noise is coming from these two, uh, and it's just coming from all the fans in here. We got we got these little small fans in here jamming air through here, and then you also have fans in each of these little power supplies. So these power supplies have been incentivized by the industry to make the, the, the power supplies are as, as tight as possible. A power supply is really sophisticated, as our power engineers will tell you. Even on, on these commodity servers, these are sophisticated power supplies. These things are packed with components. In order to get them cool, you have to have a fan that's gonna move, that, that's really gonna be working hard to move air, and you've got no insight into how much power is going into these fans. This thing is just like such a racket. You've got the VGA ports back here, of course. We've got the high-speed networking here. I think actually on the low-speed networking, there's your low-speed uh, service manager networking. But just a reminder of this kind of this old world, this commodity world, so let's close that back up. The contrast between that and what you get with it, with the oxide rack. I think one of the things that was really important to us in terms of the aesthetics, just wanted to indicate that like, hey, we actually cared about this. We cared about what this looked like as a system and putting it together. Cause I gotta tell you is if you put together racks and racks of this kind of stuff, you just think like, does nobody care about my suffering? Sitting here in a data center like this, having to cable everything up. Does anybody care about the problem that I've got? We care at Oxide. We, we really care about those folks who are, are deploying this infrastructure and then especially who are making that infrastructure available inside of their companies, their organizations, and giving them the ability to roll this stuff in, power it on, provision infrastructure, and delight their customers. That's what's really important to us at Oxide. All right, this is the, uh, this is the Oxide rack. This is it. So th this is what uh, rack scale design looks like. We've got a we've got 32 of these compute sleds here. Each of these has got an AMD Milan on there. So 7713P, single socket compute sleds. Uh, and each of the, these sleds have been designed more or less from scratch by us. So we didn't take a reference design. We did our own design because we there's some problems that we wanted to solve, some long-standing problems. We wanted to get rid of the traditional BMC. We wanted to do our own service processor on there. All of these service processors on all of these sleds are all networked together. Um, and we, we've got, a, here at the center of the rack, we've got our switches. So one of the big decisions we had at Oxide, when we first started Oxide, is what do we do about the switch? And we known from our previous experiences that the integrating with a third-party switch, integrating with a, a Cisco switch, or an Arista switch, or a Juniper switch, other white brand, white box switches out there was gonna be no end of problems. Uh, and in part because you would think like, how complicated is it to make a switch? 
Well, when the switch misbehaves, everything in the rack misbehaves. So one of the those big early decisions we had is what do we do? And what we kind of realized that we actually had to go do is that we had to go do our own switch, which for a startup is a little bit crazy because we, we knew we wanted to go do our own compute sled. To do our own switch as well just seems absurd. But we also knew that integrating with a third party switch was gonna be no end of pain. Um, so we did it, we, we, we did our own switch. So the, 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 the switches are here. We call them top of rack switches, but they're very much in the middle of the rack. Uh, in here, we have the, the, the power shelf. So one of the many problems that we were seeking to rectify, I guess no pun intended, with traditional servers is that with a traditional server, you're plugging AC power into every single server. And that those servers have power supplies in them that are converting from AC to DC. And it's a big mess. Um, it's a lot of power cables. It's really inefficient. And we knew that we to do real hyperscaler class infrastructure, we would want to do an actual true power shelf. So all of the power conversion happens here from AC to DC. And then we run DC up the down the back of the rack. And each of these sleds plugs into that DC bus bar. Each of the sleds also blind mates into networking. So the, the, the switches are here. Where's the cabling from the, the, the sled to the switch? That all happens in the cable backplane. And the, the, the sleds will blind mate into that cable backplane. So if you have a sled that malfunctions or needs to be pulled out as we have here, that sled comes out, new sled comes in, blind mates in, and you don't have to deal with any cabling whatsoever which is pretty remarkable. A couple other things to note in the front here. We've got the uh, QSFP ports coming out the front. They go up to the patch panel and disappear into your networking. So this is the actual interface into the broader network. So all of the actual networking traffic is gonna come in through these QSFP interfaces here. Uh, there's also a, a technician port that you can see here. Uh, and this is what we use to originally configure the rack. Cause you may wonder, hey, I wheel this rack into my data center. It's got to have some information. How do we bootstrap the whole process? That happens through these technician ports where we do the initial installation of the rack. And then through there, we actually lay down all of the control plane software that's actually going to run this rack as a coherent unit. You can see we've got all the, the LEDs on the, the, the drives here. They would tell us if there's a problem with a drive, we would see it with, with the service LEDs. We want to make sure the service LED tells you one thing, namely that the when the light is on, we, we know that the, the, the drive is there, we've attached to it. Uh, they're very bright. It's one of those things when we originally designed it, we saw the LEDs like, are these too bright? But um, we, we kind of like the look, honestly. I don't know what you what you think. We kind of like the, the, the landing light look here. The other thing to notice about the rack, and it's a little hard because I actually have this this old commodity rack over here in my in, in my right ear, absolutely screaming at me. And this thing is completely silent. I, ca I can't hear this rack at all. Part of the reason for this is because of the geometry of these sleds. So if you look at a traditional server architecture, we're in a DC, we're a, a co-location where you lots of other racks around here. All these other racks are like this one. They're all screaming. They all have these little rack and stack 1U servers and the, the, those servers are, they're squat and they've got these little fans in there that have to work really, really hard to push air. We've changed the geometry. We've blown it up here. It's hundred millimeters high so we can fit these 80 millimeter fans in. Turns out the efficiency of a fan is the cube of, proportion of the cube of the radius. So if you want a really efficient fan, get a big one. And these fans are really efficient and they're also really quiet. So we'll, and we'll see that when we go around to the, the, the back of the rack. Um, I don't know what else to see here. There's 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 delightfully little to see here, honestly. I mean, that's part of the value is that there's not a lot to see here. Um, we got the, these QSFPs going up to the, the fiber that's going up to the network. Should we go around to the back of the rack and check that out? It's funny, so we're behind the rack now. It was funny, when I was standing over there, I was being deafened by that other commodity server over there. As I get in here, that, that fan is, uh, is little one U fans really loud and I was freezing. Now I'm like, it's actually really quiet back here, but it's actually hot because you can feel all of the heat coming off of this thing. And it is actually really remarkable to me, always remarkable to me, how much noise the fans don't make. So we're here in the back of the rack. This is the DC bus bar in here. So this is this copper bus bar. We've got the power shelf in here. So we've got our power whips coming in there. 
They, they snake up through the floor into the rack. They convert from AC to DC. And we got that DC running up and down the rack. The cabling that we have here, this is the, this is the high speed networking here. But as a user of this rack, I don't have to unplug this cabling at all. This is all fixed. This is fixed at the factory. So this is the way it arrives. And because, you know, when you look at some of these other racks around here, cabling is a mess, in part because it's left to the user to go cable all this stuff. This is all comes pre-cabled here. We can see uh, we've got our switches here. Again, the, these are our switches in the middle of the rack. And each of these switches is connected to both sled, which allows us to balance across both switches. So we don't have an active passive or active standby in terms of the switches. Both switches are in service all the time. It does allow us to upgrade a switch, for example, without being overly disruptive. But when, when both switches are up, we can optimize across them. We can take the fastest path uh, across the network here. We can also see we got the doors here. I had opened up the doors. The doors are important. I appreciated the doors when we have to get our, our what's called EMC, our electromagnetic compliance. So it's important when you're making a product that it not radiate emissions to interfere with other products. And if we didn't all do this, when we were in a data center like this, nothing would work because everything would be interfering with one another. When we first did our compliance, I really appreciated how important these doors are because we got to close these doors to prevent any kind of stray uh, emissions from interfering with other things. So these doors are actually quite load bearing and important. Actually in here, you can see in addition to uh, the, our power shelf, there is a little light back there for our power shelf controller. So I mentioned the service processor that we did on our compute sleds. We took that same service processor and root of trust that's in the switches. And then that's also in the power shelf controller. And so the power shelf controller, the switches, the compute sleds are they're networked via the high speed network. And then we use some of the unused lanes here, unused pairs to wire up all the service processors. So you can manage this whole thing remotely without having to get any of the cabling right, which is a really big deal because on these other machines, you've got high speed networking and you've got this other management network that has to be cabled separately, managed separately and so on. Here, you don't have any of that. This is really, really clean. And if you've got, you can always see how much someone has suffered in a data center because of their reaction to this. If their reaction is like, I don't know, what else would you do? It's like, okay, that person hasn't spent much time in a data center. But with the, for the right person, they'll be like, wait a minute, wait, this is it? This is great. This is so clean and it's so absent of all of this, this other gunk that exists in the way people have been doing it historically. Because historically, it's a real kit car to take this commodity infrastructure and turn it into something that resembles a cloud. With the rack scale machine, you roll it in, you power it up, you configure it via those technician ports, and you have true elastic computing on-prem in your data center. This, this, this cabling is all done at the factory. This thing just rolls in and you power it on. That's a really big deal. So when we were coming in here into the DC, you see that sign, no boxes allowed in the data center? So if you think about like, how does one do this without oxide? How does one do this without the rack scale cloud computer? The answer is it starts with you buying 16, 20, 30, 40 different physical computers that come in their own boxes. Every one of those computers, they don't ship it as a rack, that comes in their own boxes. They all have to be deboxed. They have to take out of the cardboard box, all that packaging, and you can see some packaging, and all that packaging has got to be thrown away. You got to install that in a rack. You've got to add, then cable all of that up. And this like does not, this is not quick. This is not just days, this is weeks, this is months. And you and potentially you've got someone being like, hey, I paid a lot of money for all this equipment. Like I got developers that want to like use this stuff. Where is it? It's like, well, it's, it's taken us weeks. And we actually, by the way, haven't even like put any software on here yet. Like that's just the hardware. And so one of the things that was really important to us is we wanted the oxide rack to ship as a rack. This fits in a crate that can be air freighted, right? This crate arrives, the crate is its own active engineering. This thing rolls out of the crate, all of the sleds are in it, you power it on, all of the, the software is ready to be loaded on there, ready to go. And our goal is not just within a day, but within hours from this thing arriving in the DC, you've got developers that can go provision a VM. And someone who's only been on the cloud, that sounds like, of course, that sounds great. How else would you do it? But to somebody who's accustomed to living in these data centers, that is otherworldly. That is so much faster than what it is that they're used to, to be able to go from this thing arriving 
to their developers actually think like, hey, thanks for doing this. Like I'm, I'm using this stuff. I've got, I've used Terraform. I've configured this cluster. We're up and running. And then you just install this rack this morning. Being able to get there requires us to do this true rack scale design and to ship it as a rack.